you, worship team. Indeed, God is so good. Let's pause just for a brief moment of thanks. Father, here this morning, this is something we want to say again in prayer to you. We've sung it in worship. We want to say it in prayer. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. The blessings that you bring. Your faithfulness, which is new every morning. Blessed is your holy name. Amen. Well, welcome to church this morning. It's great you can be here. If you're new this morning, we've been doing a series titled Lessons on Assurance. We've been looking at a whole variety of topics. And today our topic is assurance of victory. Assurance of victory. The evil one, if he can do it, wants to bring negative thoughts into our minds, negative circumstances into our worlds, and he wants us to feel anything but victorious. But Jesus, as we cooperate with his teachings, promises us victory. A lot of this message will be to do with um, victory over temptation. My dad... uh, was British. Grew up in Manchester, up in the north. One of the things uh, that's very spiritual about Manchester, you know, they, they house there the earliest portion of the Bible, a portion of John's Gospel, uh, about 30 years or so after Jesus' death, they date it. Um, Dad wasn't a particularly spiritual man growing up, though, although he did sing in the church choir. Um, later in life, though, he did become a Christian. I remember as a little kid, Dad loved his British comedy. Uh, he moved out here to Australia when he was around 30, met Mum in uh, Victoria, and they got married. And uh, as a little kid in the 70s and, and uh, early 80s, I can remember shows, this will take you back, The Two Ronnies, <laughs> uh, The Goodies, saw a lot of them early in the evening, um, Foldy Towers, and he used to like Dave Allen. Dave Allen tells an interesting joke about temptation. He says, um, there were three ministers of religion that gathered together. They'd been at a conference. And while they are at the conference, um, there was all sorts of different teaching and that sort of stuff. But at the end of the conference, they asked people to break up into groups of three and to share their greatest struggles of temptation. Well, typical of these sort of jokes, there was an Orthodox priest, a Catholic priest, and an Anglican minister. These three gentlemen knew each other quite well. Their churches were nearby, and uh, they were just generally chatting, and then they said, I I guess we should get with the program and do what we've been instructed to do. Well, there was a kind of a bit of a stony silence for a while, and then the Orthodox priest spoke up, and he said... "Um, Look, there is a serious area of uh, temptation in my life, and uh, to be honest, no one really knows about it. But um, I grew up in a family of very big drinkers, and um, I normally only will drink in moderation, but I find myself, every holiday break, in the summer holidays, I go away to a hotel for about two weeks, I buy expensive bottles of scotch, and I get absolutely plastered. And I tell you what, the other two are looking at him. Mouths have dropped. No. It's true. Would you pray for me, he says. Well, um, there's some more silence for a while. And then the Catholic priest speaks up. And he says... um, Look, I really do. I was determined not to share anything at this point, but I'm going to. As you know, not far from my church, there is a brothel. And sometimes late in the evening when I've walked back to the church manse, I have felt enormous temptation. And the odd occasion I have gone in, I have slept with a woman. Well, the other two look absolutely shocked. Please pray for me, he said. Well, um, there's another pause, there's more silence, and 
they're now both looking at the Anglican minister. And he says to them, well, look, um, I do have an area of strong temptation, but I'm not going to share it with you because you'll never forgive me. You'll hate me forever. They looked at each other, the Orthodox priest and the Catholic priest, and then they looked back to the Anglican minister and they said, it couldn't be any worse than what we've shared with you. He said, oh, you will think it is. So what are you talking, are you, are you a murderer? And he said, oh, no, no, it's nothing like that. So well, what is it? Come on, it can't be that hard to share. Well, look, the only way I'm going to share is if I'm allowed to leave immediately. Well, they thought for a moment and said, okay, you can leave immediately, just, just share and we'll pray for you. He says, all right. Well, my area of temptation is gossip and I can't wait to tell everyone about you too. <laughs> Uh, well, jokes aside, let's have a look here at uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful. He will not let you, to be tempted, uh, let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Great words there within that verse. There's a lot of depth to it. Let me just mention a few portions of it. First of all, what, what is true of every temptation you or I face? Where well, they're common to people, it tells us they're common. Secondly, uh, who can give us victory when we are tempted? Well, it tells us God is faithful. He will give us victory. Um, by the way, it, it doesn't say that he'll remove the temptation anywhere, does it? It doesn't say he'll remove it. It just says he's faithful and he won't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. And finally, it tells us, he will provide a way out or a way of escape, as some translations put it. Three very helpful principles. Well, we're going to unpack each of those today. First of all, temptation is common to humanity. The first one, temptation is common to humanity. Now, I've occasionally had uh, people in my office over the years and, um, and they've said, told me that the temptation they face is like, Nothing that anyone else faces. You know, it, it's, it, no one else goes through what I go through, that sort of thing. Uh, but actually, no temptation is unique. In fact, this scripture tells us they're common to people. The temptation you face is common to many other people. And, and there, there is actually, this is a positive thing. Because actually it tells you, look, there's people that are going through the same sort of stuff you go through. And secondly, it, it tells you that there will be people who can understand and pray for you. One of the powerful things about Christianity is it's a very communal religion. Jesus, think of the disciples. Jesus lived with those 12 disciples. Community is huge in Christianity and we're supposed to do the walk together. I had a chap I was chatting with on the phone recently, a new convert. And because he works on Sunday, he finds it very difficult to get to church. And I'm having to express to him, listen, mate, I know you're spending time in prayer and in the word, which is really good. But if you don't get into Christian community, there's no way your faith is going to last. We need community. It's so important. Let me say a little bit more about the, that portion of Scripture. Look at James 1.13. It says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So a lot of temptation comes from within. 1 John 2.15 expresses this. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Three primary areas of temptation mentioned there and Look, it's, it's difficult, difficult to zone in and get clear, uh, I guess, categories from these three. There does seem to be some overlap. But the fact John words it this way, he must be thinking of ter in terms of three distinct categories. Uh, scholars today are not completely sure how they fit. But let me, let me break it up this way for the sake of this message. First of all, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. What can that mean? Well, it can mean many things. You know, one of the things that I was um, just looking at uh, today was um, uh, a national Australian survey. 
and uh, all sorts of statistics from the 2016 census. And one of the realities is the flesh, the body, loves chemicals coming into it that change the way you feel. Substance abuse is actually rampant in our country, whether it's hallucinogens, hard drugs, marijuana, you name it. The point is that this substance gets me through life and I feel better for a while. In Australia, 15% of people have admitted that within the 12 months before filling out that census, that they had taken illicit drugs, 15%, over 15% actually. That's just ones that's owned up to it. That's three million plus people. And of course we have other legal types of drugs that can get a hold of people too, when they're done, you know, used in excess. But you see, okay, that's, a, that's kind of a, a physical fleshly desire. But you see, there's soulish fleshy desires too. Listen to the way Proverbs words this. Proverbs 18.8. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the innermost parts. It almost sounds like a drug too, doesn't it? But this, this, is, um, this is affecting the soul, not the body. And some people crave that, 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 that gossip. You know, um, it's interesting how people are, are drawn to all manner of gossip on social media. You know, there's this thirst for it, this interest in it, an unhealthy interest at times. You know, let, let me move on to another area, the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. Um, people are so often deeply attracted to other beautiful humans. It's just a reality. The lust of the eyes has probably never been more alive than what it is today. I was watching a documentary recently that I'd picked up from Kurong called The Heart of Man. And in the documentary, it interviews, I think, about 10 different people, um, men, women of all ages. And it's dealing with this area, the lust of the eyes. An account executive for many years, Trailer LaVaughan is one of the people who speaks and talks about his life in this documentary. Let's have a look at him here with his, his lovely wife and his wedding day, and there's a picture of them with their first baby. One Saturday morning, Trailer's wife, Melanie, was uh, at the supermarket, and he's on his laptop and an adult chat room link just popped up. He clicked on it, browsed it, spotted a beautiful woman. He started to communicate with her. And that morning, one of the statements she said to him was, I can be in Birmingham tonight if you want me. He had a choice at this moment. There's some serious temptation going on. There's a, there's a point where he could have said no. But he said yes. He had his first one night stand. He realised he'd broken his marriage vows and he'd broken his vows before God. He felt a deep sense of shame and he kept asking himself the question, why couldn't I say no? But over the next months, and years, he states that, um, well, the lust of the eyes took over. Again, he found himself going through the same process again with different women, women he didn't know, women that were attractive, women that were beautiful to the eye, and he had six more. One night stands. He says it, it became something where, you know, whenever my marriage wasn't going well with Melody, it became a place of escape, as he words it. They were there, these other women were there to make him feel better about himself, he says. And of course, the shame and the guilt was prevalent. 
but he kept on doing it. Well, one day, Melanie, Melody found some uh, receipts in his wallet, things he'd bought for his last encounter. She confronted him, had it out with him, and she realised, my husband has been unfaithful. She was deeply hurt, she was furious. They separated for six months. A deep level of love was still in Melody's heart for her husband and she still wanted to make it work. They got back together. Lots of promises made and that sort of thing. One year later, he did it again. She found out. Trailer says he kept on thinking to himself, what is so fundamentally broken in me that after Melody even had forgiven me and took me back, I did it again. Well, she divorced him. They remained divorced for six years. Of course, he's still the father to their four children. And Melody felt he's actually a fantastic dad. They went through quite a journey during those divorced years. And believe it or not, because he hadn't fallen in that time again, she had him back. She forgave him. And the extraordinary thing is, they've been married now for six years, and even though it's a struggle because of all that history, they would say their marriage has never been better. Here's a picture of them, of them now. This is just recent. been such an extraordinary story um, they are now marriage coaches for the organisation Undone and Redone but doesn't it tell us just how powerful the lust of the eyes are here is this guy in what is really to be honest a happy marriage and let yet the lust of his eyes almost destroyed everything that he had Another area is the pride of life. Remember that phrase, the pride of life. And this is probably more the things out in the world. It can include things like, well, it's quality education, respected career, sending my children to the best private schools, purchase of all manner of status symbols, living in a prestigious suburb, luxury house with luxury furniture. Nothing wrong with these things necessarily. But I believe that what John is talking about is this pride of life that can dominate and overtake people, where it all becomes about status. Another, another way it's worded in a different translation is the boasting about what people have and do. I remember um, a couple that had gone into the ministry and uh, well, you know, they, they'd made, they, they made very good money in real estate and um, the income became quite different and uh, they had quite a prestigious vehicle so they, they sold that and bought just a normal car. They were telling me one day that, um, that when they did that, a couple of their, what they thought were really good friends because they didn't drive the right car anymore, just didn't want anything to do with them. That's how real this is, friends. Let me move into a completely different source of temptation because it's also the devil that attacks and tries to lure us into temptation. Look at this, 1 Peter 5.8. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So outside of those three areas, Satan himself will come and try and attack you in any way he can. Another reality of temptation that you can be confronted with and he will use whatever methods he thinks are going to work whatever they might be his purpose to lure you into temptation is to devour you or to destroy you let me look at another area God is faithful it says in the scripture that I quoted at the beginning God is faithful 1 Corinthians 10:13 
another conversation I've had in my office on the odd occasion is that uh, some people will say, oh, anyone would have fallen to that temptation. You know, if you were there, you'd have fallen too. No one could have withstood that temptation that I faced. No one. But of course, um, the portion that says God is faithful goes on to say he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. God actually promises that. He's faithful. And so actually, if you fall, it was your choice. There's never a point when the temptation is so strong you couldn't withstand it. Because he promises he's faithful, he won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Listen to these wonderful words. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. See, that's the thing. The evil one may come and try and attack, but we have this wonderful confidence that God is the great protector. Call out to him for his protection. Strengthen you and protect you. Uh, we, we had an interesting conversation actually at, at Alpha um, with uh, a couple of people from an Iranian background, so I've got a Muslim heritage, and uh, just recently, and um, it's interesting chatting with them. And um, they talked about, you know, we, we Christians will say we're the only religion that understands God in this really personal sense, this intimate sense, you know, being able to talk with him. And they said, no, 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 we understand it like that too. And, um, but then I introduced the Lord's Prayer, or Martin introduced the Lord's Prayer. And when we talked about using the word Father, it's a word they would never use because it seems too personal. And then I talked about the word Abba, which is even more intimate, Daddy. Yeah, it's interesting, this journey. My understanding of... Um, Islam is that Allah is never tempted. Allah is never tempted, their God. But look at this Hebrews verse, Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. It refers to Jesus. Jesus was tempted in every way. He understands temptation. He didn't fall, but he understands temptation. We have a God who understands that we are tempted. And you know, I tell you what, because he understands, we can be even more confident of his help. The third portion of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us that we can look for a way out. God's going to provide that. A way out or a way of escape, as some translations put it. But we have to choose to take that way of escape. Um, you think of uh, the great story about Joseph with his father Jacob. Joseph was sold into slavery at just 17 years of age. And it um, must have been a horrendous experience, but he was bought by Potiphar a man who worked for the Pharaoh, wealthy man, big estate. He started to see the gifts and talents of this young man, clearly an educated young man, a man that he discovers has great leadership skills. And so ultimately Joseph becomes in charge of his entire household. But unfortunately for Joseph, Potiphar's wife took an interest in him. Potiphar's a very wealthy man. His wife was probably very beautiful, a real temptation. Well, she keeps at him. She's trying to lure him, constantly trying to get him to sleep with her. He was well built and handsome. She was attracted to him. And Joseph kept choosing the way out. He didn't fall to temptation, even to the point where she's grabbed hold of him so tightly, his coat, that he fled, leaving the coat behind. He's always getting in trouble with coats, wasn't he, Joseph? Joseph fled temptation. He fled. He got out of there. 
you and I, we've got to look for the way of escape. I want to share with you five principles to finish this sermon that will actually help you choose the way of escape because it doesn't come naturally. It comes because these principles are apparent in our lives. Let me share them with you. First of all, Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 9, and I'll jump to 13. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Notice he puts that right in his prayer. It's just a short example of a prayer, and he's got some stuff about temptation in it. That we should be praying, Lord, may I not be led into temptation. Lord, help me not to fall to temptation. Lord, may I not be directed into a path of temptation. We're supposed to pray that. Can I suggest, the first thing I learn, is if we're going to choose the way of escape, we need to be people of prayer. And we need to pray specifically against temptation. Part A, pray. Part A, pray. Psalm 119, 9 and 11 says this, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. People who have actually got a commitment to say, if the Bible says it, I want to live it. If the Bible says it, I want to live it. People who are like that, you know, that's going to make a big difference. But how do you really get the word of God into your life? Well, it goes on to say in verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do we hide God's word in our heart? I think there's two keys. One is meditation, thinking about it deeply, reflecting upon it. And secondly is memorization. And you remember in this series I'm saying there's one key verse I'd like you to memorize each week. And this week, of course, it's the 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you except those which are common to people. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But with the temptation, he'll provide a way out so that you can endure it. To get those verses into our heads, so important. You know, I'll tell you what, actually, um, it was a, a verse that I had to memorise as a new believer. And I remember uh, saying to, uh, I happened to, being, uh, happened to be discipled by the pastor of the church, and I remember saying to um, Pastor Kim Valentine, uh, I found this one really difficult, Kim. And he said, yeah, well, it's probably a very strategic verse. Satan will make it difficult for you to memorise. I was thinking it's just because it was a long one, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, this is key God's word is key part B if we want to be people who frequently choose the way of escape the way out God's word has got to be deeply into our, in our hearts in our lives 1 John 5 4 and 5 says this for everyone born of God overcomes the world so there's that overcoming verse that victory verse for everyone born of God ultimately you overcome the world this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Faith is key. Who is it that overcomes the world? The one who, has, who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So it's not just general faith. It's not just this, uh, I believe in myself, or I've got this kind of cosmic faith going on in my world. No, it's actually quite specific, isn't it? It's faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Faith is key. If we're going to choose the way out, the way of escape, we need to be people of faith. Part C, faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is going to be key. Hebrews 4.16 says this, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Ah, this is huge. Look at it there, God's throne of grace. Grace is God's unmerited favour. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. But he gives it to us. It's a gift. The other phrase, we can receive mercy. See, one of the problems, I was saying this to a gentleman just recently, you know, one of the problems is if I uh, think, yeah, I've, I've really overcome this area. And then you fall again. Well, of course, Satan will be in your ear saying, well, that's all over, mate. If you get this Christian deal. Forget it. It's all done. But God's grace says, no, come back to me. Come back to me. Receive forgiveness and start again. D, understand God's grace. 
If we're gonna choose the way out, we need to be people who have a proper understanding of God's grace. The person who feels overwhelmingly condemned just gives up. And finally, one more point, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The first four points are all about learning to submit to God. Prayer, his word, faith and understanding his grace. Submitting to God. And when you're submitting to God, you have the power to resist the devil. If you stand firm in resistance against the evil one, he'll flee from you. That's what it says. He will flee from you. He does not have the power to persist. You submit to God, you resist him, he will flee. His influence over your life immediately diminishes as you continually resist him. Let's read that powerful verse again. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. The verse is on the front of your handout today. Why don't you take it away, put it somewhere, memorize it. Let it become part of your life. Let me ask the worship team to return because we're going to close in prayer. Shall we stand together? Let's be upstanding. Father, here today again, we are just reminded vividly that your word is so practical, life related. You have specific scriptures on every possible thing that we could imagine. And Father, here today, I just pray that you'd speak to each of us. Is there a temptation that frequently seizes you? Lord, bring it to mind. Is there a temptation that frequently seizes you? Father, bring it to mind this morning. And Lord, also, would you bring to mind the way of escape in this scenario, Lord, what is your way of escape? May each and every mind be aware of this. We're told in your scriptures we must be alert. May we be a people who are alert to see the way of escape. So Father, we want to be a people who have victory. A victorious Christian life. Help us to live in victory, Lord for the glory of Jesus and for the extension of his kingdom. Amen.